April um, meeting, and it's Monday, April 14th, 2008. Um, can we have the roll call, please? Yes. Councilor Chairman, uh, <laughs> Chairman Lynch. Uh, present. Councilor Becker. Here. Councilor Dill. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor McKenney. Here. Councilor Rowe. Here. Councilor Swift Kayata. Here. Okay. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on our agenda is the review of the minutes of um, March 3rd, 2008 and March 25th, 2008. And move to accept both. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? It'll be six zero. Okay. The next um, thing uh, is not something that's on our agenda, but I think um, we would be remiss tonight if we didn't take a moment to recognize Henry Berry, who passed away on March 30th. Henry was a Cape Elizabeth resident for over 40 years. He was a dedicated public servant, a good lawyer, a talented musician. Henry also served three terms on the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. First, from 1968 to 1971, and later from 1997 to 2003. During his first term, Henry helped draft the town's zoning ordinances and he was one of the four councillors in a 4-3 vote to maintain Fort Williams as a park. Fort Williams was always um, something that was um, very important and um, near and dear to Henry. Um, he was um, always vigilant about maintaining the character of the town um, and the character of Fort Williams, and he was a fierce opponent even in recent years to any change, including um, charging user fees at Fort Williams. And, and it was um, kind of neat to go to his uh, funeral um, or celebration of his life last week and see his Save the Fort signs that his family had put up on the wall. Um, Henry was a friend of the little guy. I remember when the bank that the town used started to require fingerprints to cash the payroll checks for the school and town employees, for those people who didn't have accounts at the bank. And Henry was really incensed and angry about that. And he was um, always challenging our manager on the choice of banks after that. I'm sure Michael remembers that. Um, and Henry challenged all of us from time to time. He was fiercely independent and he always voted in what he believed to be the best interests of the residents of the town, notwithstanding the personal consequences or the personal political consequences. Henry was a Republican, but despite being a strong party man, Henry always voted for the person and he exercised independent judgment in the voting booth um, Henry once confided to me, um, and I had worked for uh, Governor Joe Brennan in the, well, I won't say when I did, that would start to date me, but Henry once confided in me that indeed he had also voted for uh, Joe Brennan. And uh, again, last week I was really glad to see a few members of the uh, Brennan administration and, and many prominent Democrats at the celebration of Henry's life. Um, so although he was a, a staunch Republican, he was a guy who liked to get things done and uh, was willing to work with um, both sides. Um, Henry also, I think, was the true compassionate Republican. He served for many years on the Thomas Jordan Grant Subcommittee. Um, and that's the um, committee which, or that's the fund which helps town residents in need. Um, and Henry was always very creative um, on that committee. I remember at one time there was a single mother who came in and was having difficulty uh, because um, her car broke down and she could no longer get herself to work. And Henry actually went out himself and haggled with a used car dealer and um, used the Thomas Jordan funds to uh, make sure that this town resident had a decent car to get back and forth to work from. 
Um, I, I and I, I'm sure other people in this room have a very special memory of Hem, Henry, um, and that, that was formed before I got to know Henry very well. In fact, it was my first meeting on the town council. It was June 11, 2001, and the town was com commemorating the centennial of town hall. Henry, um, for those who know him, uh, you all know Henry was a great musician, and he brought his electric um, keyboard here. This was my first town council meeting, and Henry had his keyboard out here, and he played the Star Spangled Banner, Yankee Doodle, and America, um, the three songs that had been sung by town residents 100 years earlier in the dedication of the town hall. Henry truly was an American original. Although not a caper by birth, he certainly was one by choice. And we are certainly richer for having had Henry in our community for 40-plus um, years. He will be missed not just by his family, to whom we extend our condolences, but also by those of us um, who had the honor of serving with Henry on this council. So I just want to make sure that we recognize a really special guy. Okay. I don't know if there's anyone else who wants to say. There were only a couple of us left who served with Henry, but um, well, he was well a great guy. So, okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is um, re reports and correspondence, and we've got um, an update from the Gull Crest Nordic Ski Trails Committee. We'll um, hear from the uh, two updates first, the Gull Crest Nordic Ski Committee and then the Farm Committee, and then we'll go back to our reports and correspondence. Okay? So, if you could state your name. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm Muslim Martin. Um, I'm a resident of Oregon's Lane, Cape Elizabeth, and uh, past president of Cape Nordic, and uh, did some coaching with the middle school Nordic program. And currently, myself and Dave Roberts are co-chairman of the Gulf Press Trail Committee. So we've been pretty involved with, with, with the ongoing project. Um, Mike um, and Dave and I had gotten together a couple of weeks ago, and we had talked about perhaps it would be um, appropriate for our committee to update the town council on, on the, the present status of the Gulf Crest Trail. And so we just want to take a couple minutes to to go over um, and update you on a few things. And then if, if there's time allowed, if, if you have questions, we'll try to address those. Um, just to give a very quick and brief history, um, the Gold Crest Trail project was begun about two years ago. And um, basically, the project was broken into two major phases, phase one and phase two. Phase one is a two and a half kilometer um, trail, multi-use trail that was um, developed over the last uh, year and a half, two years. And um, we are now entering into the second phase of our development. And that's actually what I really wanted to spend most of the time in terms of updating. But I'll just go through a real brief history of, of phase one. Uh, we began our work on uh, the Gold Crest Trail phase one um, back in October of 06. And we had great um, hopes and aspirations of possibly getting a trail done in the fall of 06 in time for the snow to fly that year. Um, and actually, we, we kind of got a late start on it, but we began um, clearing trails with work parties. We had over uh, 308 man, uh, man hours of volunteer time from the community, Cape Nordic people, as well as other uh, members of other groups, the cross-country ski team, or I'm sorry, the cross-country running team also helped, and other members of the community. And we were actually fortunate in uh, the fall of, of 06 to actually complete the trail and have it excavated uh, by Skip Murray and um, completed, that, completed the excavation of phase one in late December. And it turned out that snow had held off um, two years ago. Um, we had our first major snow, snowfall in Jan early January. And um, we were able to utilize that trail that first year for skiing. The first day it was skied on was January 15th of 06. And during that first winter, and, and Mike, Mike has told Dave and I that um, ever since we built that trail, all it's done is snow in Cape Elizabeth the last two winters. <laughs> but we were able to utilize that trail 
for um, 67 skiable days, and um, we didn't actually keep a head count of how many people utilized that trail during the first year, but certainly the school teams, as well as numerous uh, community members, um, used that trail, and, and we had a terrific first year. But as we all know, that trail is not just a ski trail, and we were very happy with the, the multi-use of that trail coming into the spring of, um, of the following year. Um, we did have, um, you may recall, we did have a community day in February of 06. We had a ribbon cutting um, ceremony. Mike and Paul were there, and David, I know, came and skied the trail. Um, so we had a great open community event in February of a year ago. Um, and also during that first winter, um, with, with donations from uh, Cape Nordic as well as fundraising efforts, we were also able to buy, in coordination with the town, a Scandic uh, um, snowmobile groomer or snow, snow machine to do grooming. And during that first year, we were able to um, do grooming on a regular basis. And we also were able to purchase grooming equipment. Um, going into the, the, the next year, the trail was used during the spring and summer. We, we did put together some work parties during that spring and um, did some additional clearing and chipping of the brush that we had pulled off the trail and um, continued to work on phase one. Um, and again, during that spring and into that summer, the trail was used extensively by walkers, bikers, um, bird watchers. Um, so we had a lot of use during that first summer. Um, we also, and some of you may have noted that a kiosk went up during that summer. Um, Spencer Garland, who's a uh, member of the Eagle Scouts, did his Eagle Scout project and in fact constructed and built with his dad and with, his, with Eagle Scout help uh, the new kiosk that is up at the trailhead at phase one. Um, going into phase two, um, Phase two is an additional three and a half kilometer loop. Um, and we have, have just recently embarked on, on, on starting phase two. Um, the first part of that um, effort um, has to do, has, we have to have some engineering done and some engineering assessment done. And we have uh, currently just paid for to the town to have OS do the permitting and engineering assessment of that. And that, that project is actually just, just beginning to take place and is ongoing. We're looking at about, I think, a 90-day uh, window to get the OST permitting complete, completed. And the hope is that once that um, permitting and all that um, pending um, assessment is done, that we can then begin to uh, work on phase two. We did just have a work party this past weekend, and we... Uh, rewalked, reblazed, and and cleared a path of phase two, and um, we we now have that cleared because the uh, engineering people at OST want to do a walk through of phase two in another week or so. So we're preparing preparing for that. Um, we also um, you may recall that the original design of that trail was done by an individual named John Morton, who was a past Olympian and um, professional trail. Um, designer. Um, we've actually recently been in contact with him and we are trying to contract him to come back and spend another day with us, particularly after we walk through phase two. If there are any issues or changes or tweaking that we need to do, we'd like to have his input, input on that. Um, so going forward, uh, the hope is that um, assuming all the permitting goes through, we, we hope to begin work on phase two. We do need to do some additional fundraising. Um, we've, we've had fundraising efforts ongoing throughout the whole two-year project, um, but we are currently working on another capital campaign and some additional fundraising. Um, but the hope is that um, we would begin work on phase two this summer, and we may, in fact, break phase two into sections and do one kilometer sections at a time um, so we don't really know the exact timetable of completion of phase two, but the hope is to begin it this summer and have perhaps another portion of that ready for, for skiing and grooming for next year. Um, we do have a map here that if you want to look at this in more detail of um, phase one is this 
the smaller trail in this area, and that's the one that is completed. Phase two, as you can see, is a little more of an ambitious effort, but um, that's an outline of that. Um, the only final point I wanted to make was that um, I've been impressed um, by how this has been such a joint effort of the town, Cape Nordic, uh, other members of our community. I think it's been a, a terrific coming together of, of multiple groups and utilizing this trail. One of, the, one of our concerns was that perhaps we may have some issues with the trail being a shared use trail with, with the snowmobile community. We've had terrific cooperation with the snowmobilers. They've helped us in some of our work parties. They've been very uh, cooperative and helpful. And in fact, we've now found that there's enough other trails out there that, in fact, snowmobilers really aren't using the Gold Crest Trail to, to any great extent, although they're certainly welcome to do so. Um, one of the other um, concerns by the council initially was that we might, um, we might be too too exclusive in our use during the, with, with the trail in the winter with the ski team, but in fact we found that we only had, we've had several races on the trail, but we've really only tied up the trail um, for two days, or, and only a portion of two days for, for races. So it's been a great cooperative effort. We've had terrific help um, with, the, with uh, Bob Malley and, and all the people at Public Works. They've helped us in maintaining our snowmobile. They've helped us with um, repairing some of our grooming equipment. So it's just been a terrific synergy of, of groups and um, we certainly have, I know speaking personally, I think um, the whole effort has far exceeded my, my expectations and I know that we've had many, many um, great positive comments and support for what's been ongoing. The, the one criticism we've had is that in fact phase, phase one is a fairly technical hilly uh, terrain on that phase. Phase two is actually a flatter course and, and I know there are a lot of people looking forward to skiing and utilizing phase two because it is a little less rigorous. So again, thank you for, for all of your support and if there are any questions or Dave, I don't know if I've missed any points that you wanted to highlight. Or... Uh, any questions from the council? Yeah, I, thank you, Marion. I just had a couple of comments. One, it has been an enjoyable working with this. Some of you, and I know those that have been around Gullcrest, know there have been trails there longer than two years. And when, when Mr. Barton refers to the Gullcrest Trail, he's simply referring to that Nordic ski program trail and not to the full network of trails. And when he's referring to the Gullcrest Trail Committee, he's referring to the Nordic Ski uh, Gullcrest Trail Committee, not to a, not to a fuller committee. Uh, also, the conditions of approval when Phase 1 was approved made clear that the Conservation Commission would be fully involved in the review of Phase 2, and that is part of what will be going on over the next 90 days as part of the, the permitting and, and review process. I, I just wanted to make those points clear so that, so that there isn't any confusion. I know Jack Roberts and other people who have worked on trails for years, the snowmobile group, would, would, might take a little bit of exception that the, the trails just came a year and a half ago, and I, I, you know, I just wanted to be specific that the Nordic ski improvement began then, but there, there have been other trails there since the town owned it, and I'm sure before. So, are there any questions for Muzzy or Dave, David? How are you doing on your fundraising for Phase Two? Well, it, it's interesting. We've we've um, I met this morning actually with an individual. We're, we're really we've we've had two major um, capital campaigns, mailing campaigns. Um, seems as quickly as we raise money, we spend it. Um, we also have been uh, working on several grant proposals and, and really we're, we're, we sort of have a three-tiered approach to our fundraising. Uh, one is through individual fundraising and solicitation with, 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 with fundraising letters. The second phase is really going after the grant writing and uh, Dave and I, um, it's certainly not my expertise. We've actually, if there are any volunteers for our committee to come join us and help us with grant writing, but we are working on grant writing. We also um, have just embarked on a third tier, which is really looking for corporate sponsorship. And this morning, I actually met with an individual to solicit some corporate uh, sponsorship. We're actually looking at perhaps naming right ideas to the to the parts of the ski trail or whatever. But we are are, are going forward with that. 
Um, we, we do need to raise our primary cost um, really comes with excavation of the trail. Most of the clearing and a lot of the, of the grading work we can do with work parties, but the actual formal excavation of the trail, pulling stumps, leveling, really needs to be done with a professional excavator. We use Skip Murray for phase one. We anticipate using him again. Um, we've estimated the cost, and Dave can correct me on this if I'm wrong, We've, we've estimated that the cost is about um, $15,000 per kilometer in, in actual excavation cost. So that's, that's, the, that's the real nut that we have to crack in terms of raising that money. Um, I don't know where our current balance is right now. We've actually just paid for the uh, engineering assessment. Um, so we're actually looking to raise more money. I think we've raised about $60,000 to date. Uh, and also, I should point out that uh, Skip Murray has uh, contributed in kind uh, and done an excellent job. And I think he's uh, willing to contribute about $7,500 in kind for phase two. We actually have just had a new person join our group as part of the Gold Crest Committee, who's an individual in town who actually has some excavating equipment, and he has volunteered his time and services to help us with some of that excavation of phase two. So we're hoping we can defray some of that excavation cost by doing particularly the areas that are fairly dry and fairly open. We feel we can do some of that ourselves without doing formal excavation in all the areas. But we do certainly have some more fundraising to do. Great. Well, so oh, Paul? Just, just uh, one comment. First, I'd like to congratulate you guys. I mean. Tremendous job. And I think it's important for everybody to realize that the town's cost here is nominal. It's really nominal, and we're getting such a great benefit that everybody has access to. I just thank you very much for your efforts. Um, one other point that I meant to mention, and, and I think it's, a, it's a, an important point, is that this last year, because we had the great snow, amount of snow, the Nordic ski programs at the school both the elementary as well as the um, middle and high school were actually to, able to train on the Gulf Crest Trail for probably 85 percent of their training days. Um, in previous years, the teams have been bussed up to either Twinbrook or Pineland Farms. This last year, I know the high school team, I have a son on the high school team, I know they went to Twinbrook I think five or six times and to Pineland twice and every other day that they trained, which was 30 plus days they trained here locally. And not only is that a great savings in terms of the expense of transportation, but the actual time that they get on snow and able to utilize that trail is, is, is terrific. So that's been a, a, another great success from the program. But again, I, I almost find the most reward in, in meeting people on the trail that aren't members of the ski team, that are just community members, people out snowshoeing, people out walking their dog. I mean, we've had terrific mul multiple use of the trail, and that's, that's I think, the real, the real um, important part of the trail. So. Cape Elizabeth is one of the few places you can drop off your trash and then go for a two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Recycle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Muzzy and Dave, and please extend our thanks to the rest of your committee. I know many people have worked hard to um, bring this to fruition, and it really is a truly a wonderful asset. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next um, item on our agenda is an update from the Cape Elizabeth Farm Committee. I promised everybody I will be brief because I could talk about this subject for hours. Um, the first thing I want to say is it seems quite appropriate that I would be standing in the council chambers talking about farming. And I think there was a man who used to sit right over there whose passion was town government and his second passion was farming. So thank you very much for allowing me to do this. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, recognize the members of the uh, Cape Farm Alliance, and we have many members in the audience here. If you'd stand up so that uh, people can see a portion of the people who came together to create 
uh, the progress report that has been submitted to the council. And he did a great job. So what have we been up to all winter? Uh, we haven't been planting vegetables, I can tell you that, but the last time I stood here in front of you, I was here to say that it was imperative that we get together a committee for this town to address farming in Cape Elizabeth. And um, that was part of the comprehensive uh, plan approval process, and um, you were kind enough to approve a grassroots bottom-up approach. It would not be funded by the town, and I assured you at that time that we had a town full of talented people who would come forward and support this effort. Well, it happened. On November 14th, over 40 people gathered at Sprague Hall to help kick off the Cape, at that time, the Cape Lucas Farm Committee. Um, they came to listen to what was it we were trying to accomplish. And it was really accomplishing the understanding of the agricultural assets that we have in this town and what we could do as a community to ensure their viability and sustainability. Um, they bought it, I have to tell you. Because on November 28th, I had over 30 people uh, gather at the Cape Elizabeth Fire Station, and I um, laid out the framework for what we would use over the next several months, because I said farmers will go back to the fields in April. We only have till April to get this done. We organized into seven committees, seven subgroups, agriculture and students, ordinances, taxation, agricultural assets, future farming and innovation, marketing and outreach, conservation and preservation. And I have to tell you, we brought together one of the most powerful marketing teams that any corporation could ever want. Um, we brought together a team of people to really look at what can we, how can we create awareness in the schools for agriculture. I have had four SPP students approach me to now participate in the farms for their projects. We will have food uh, from the farms into the school cafeterias. We have an inventory of the growers and the horse farms and the horse owners in Cape Elizabeth. We have a plan for how to conserve and preserve farms, and we have a marketing plan that is going to wow the whole town. We had over 700 person hours put into this work, and I really think it demonstrates the importance of agriculture in the town. We have a few people who thought they might attend only one meeting, but they've now been roped into spending their life with uh, how to promote farms. <laughs> we are positioned for success. We've identified the key changes that need to be done to assure the sustainability of farms in our town. We are now the Cape Farm Alliance. We are a presence on an ongoing basis for advocacy for the, town, for the town farms and farmland, and we're a resource to all committees and all departments within the town. We are, we are going to create visibility through our website, through newspapers. We are now visible at the state and federal level. Um, it's, it just amazes me, the calls that I get from people with the work that we've done and how impressed they are with what we have accomplished. We've engaged students and youth, and we have collaboration across all farms. And when I talk about farms, I am talking about, uh, you know, two-acre growers to the 40-acre growers to the horse farms to the horse owners. Um, what I would hope is that we don't let this work atrophy. We all need to listen and take action. I think that what it's proven to me once again that community organizing and grassroots movements is what makes our community great. And it actually is what makes our country great. Um, I continually, wherever I go, discover people who want to share their time in something as valuable as this. 
And as we move forward, and we have submitted our progress report to all of you, and I want to uh, stress that it is a progress report because we have a lot more work to do. That's our beginning, that's our springboard, and we intend to carry it forward. We want to be recognized as an integral part of the community to champion agriculture. We look forward to working with all of you on the recommendations as we traverse these recommendations through the acceptance and approval process. Um, we ask um, for interim decisions that may need to be made for this farm season. Um, and we, you know, a simple example of, uh, you know, addressing signage or some other ordinances that we may need to talk about. There, um, we request that uh, at the workshop that we hope will be on Wednesday, correct? It is. Wednesday we at 7.30. We, we will delve into all of the uh, areas where town government is integral to, its imp to the implementation of this plan. There are many aspects of the plan that we as a committee can make happen um, without town government involvement and we will, we will move forward with those. With that, I want to tell you that um, each time I would get really frustrated and go, holy cow, what did I, add? What did I commit to here? I, there were three people that I thought of, and I, and I don't want to slight anybody, but there are three people I continually thought of who have kept farming growers alive in Cape Elizabeth, and that's Kenny Maxwell, Alvin Jordan, and Bill Jordan. And those are the people who kept me thinking about, my God, they kept farming going when it really was painful. So I, I should be able to get a team of people to produce a report. Um, and we did it. And the other thing I'd like to do is thank Jim Rowe for believing in us because it was your support that helped us get through. So any questions, comments? Yes. Go ahead. Well, uh, this is not a question, but I have read through your whole report, and it's incredibly impressive. I just want to tell you, it, it is one of the best reports that I've ever seen in terms of its completeness and the detail, and I look forward to working on these issues with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, I just want to uh, send it right back to you guys, uh, Penny. Uh, back last September, October, whenever the meeting was, that, that it, I kind of suggested that we should allow people to go ahead and move forward. Uh, I really didn't have any idea of where it would go. I knew we had a lot of talented people. I've known you my whole life and, and several of the other members on the committee I've known for my whole life. So I knew we had a lot of talent. I just didn't have any idea that it would come out uh, the way it has. and and. You are, to, you are to thank for this. I mean, you have held everybody together. You've kept us on task, and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and, and I look forward to continue working with you over the coming months and years, hopefully. Well, you can't get away because you have to help us implement everything. <laughs> 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 I'll say ditto for the rest of the council. I, I, we, we've all read the report, and I know we're all looking forward to our workshop on Wednesday night where in a little more informal setting we'll be meeting with you and the rest of the farm committee and uh, then we'll really start to figure out what we need to do as a town government but you're right there's so much that you can do just in the private sector and it's just really uh, staggering how much has been accomplished in four months so thank you Penny Can I make just a brief comment? Yes, I'm Frank, Frank, of course. I served on the uh, Compact Committee. And I just want to you know, really congratulate Penny with the work that she's done. I think the whole group that's been with her from the very beginning. And really been <laughs> the work of it. Okay, so um, those of you who have a special interest in the topic, uh, our workshops are open and we welcome. Uh, any of you here and any of you who are at home watching on TV to come to the workshop on Wednesday night and we'll be devoted. I think that's the only thing on our agenda. As of this point. As of now. So um, we'll have a, a, a fulsome discussion on Wednesday night.
So thank you, Penny, and thank you, committee, for great work. Okay, at this point in our agenda, um, we will go to reports and correspondence. And I did just want to mention one other thing before I turn to my fellow um, counselors. Um, and, and all the counselors received this. We received a report. I'll wait till the room clears. Totally impressive. We received a report from um, Rachel Stemieskin, who is the chairman of the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Committee. And um, Rachel was um, pleased to report that Cape Elizabeth's recycling rate for February uh, 2008 was 30, over, just over 30%. That was up from 25% in January and um, up from 19% just a year ago. And you might say, well, you know, that's nice, no big deal. But solid waste is the second largest item in our town budget after the school department. So I just want, you'll see more and more in the courier and um, other, other places about the importance of recycling. But I just wanted to use this opportunity to remind um, our fellow citizens that we do have a single stream recycling now. Everything that can be recycled can go into um, the silver bullets together. You don't need to sort your recyclable material. And I know just um, doing it myself, I have, um, I'm probably recycling about 60 or 70 percent um, without trying all that hard. Um, so I would just uh, use this opportunity to ask people to go on our website. Um, if you don't know what can be recycled and what can't be, it's, there are posters on the silver bullets, which are behind Town Hall and at the transfer station. And I know all the folks that work at the transfer station would also be glad to help you. So um, it's uh, something that we can, it's an area where all of us can help to save the town money with not too, too much effort. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Any other reports from counselors? Anne? I have a, a couple of things. I just wanted to report, um, it seems like a long time ago now, but we have not had a formal uh, or a, tel a regular business meeting since um, then. But I attended the National League of Cities meeting on behalf of the MMA, uh, the Maine Municipal Association, in March. And I just wanted to report that we um, met with our congressional delega delegation, both our senators and both our U.S. representatives, and have very productive meetings with them. And I must say that they are, I can, I can say with confidence that all four of them are very aware of important municipal issues. And uh, I wanted to thank them for their good work on those issues. Secondly, I wanted to um, thank Cynthia Dill for arranging the tax forum that took place on March 13th. I was one of the speakers among a cast of many others. Um, and I was pleased to do it. I thought a lot of good information came out. And I appreciate her initiative in putting this together. And I understand that it was going to be repeated on some other cable, uh, you know, Channel 3 community television stations in other towns. So hopefully um, that we were able to shed a little bit of light on the, the tax issue. It's a big subject. Lastly, uh, I am the council member on the um, Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee. And uh, we have been meeting monthly or, or even more frequently than that for the last, since the uh, beginning of the year. And we have been touring other local community libraries to get a sense of what are the possibilities um, to try to think outside the box a little bit about what potentially could happen with our library. So far, the committee has toured the Topsom Library, Gorham, and Freeport. And they all have their pluses and minuses, but it's been very interesting. Um, the committee has also issued a request for proposal uh, to get a library consultant, which I had never heard of before, but it's um, an area of expertise that can shed a lot of light on what you want to do with your, with your program and with your library building. We got seven proposals back. They've been narrowed to three. And later this month, we will be interviewing those three different consultants uh, to determine who 
the committee will be working with over the next year. So just to bring you up to date on what's going on in some of those other committees. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Jim? The uh, Sproink Meeting House Committee uh, is meeting this Thursday night. We have received uh, three proposals from engineers who would like to be project manager for, for the restoration efforts. Uh, we'll be starting to consider those proposals uh, on Thursday. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? No? Michael? I'll pass tonight. You'll pass. Okay. We are at the point in our agenda where um, we welcome citizens to discuss items that are not on our agenda. When we get to items that are on our agenda, we'll allow um, some time for those items as well. But if you are here about wetlands, for instance, that is an item that is not on our agenda. And now would be the time to speak to us about wetlands. If you are here about taverns and bars, that's on our agenda. If you're here on the budget, it's on our agenda. So if there's anyone who would like to speak to us on an item not on our agenda, and seeing none, we will go right to the first item on our agenda, which is item 50, which is a proposed zoning ordinance amendment to regulate bars and taverns. And um, I'll just discuss this since it was my idea. Um, we have had some citizens raise some concerns about um, bars in Cape Elizabeth. And um, interestingly, it is an area that we didn't have any ordinance um, to speak of. So, um, and it seemed to me, I don't really have a position so much on whether we should have a bar or shouldn't have a bar. But it struck me that if we have bars and taverns, we should have some regulation that would be reasonable and appropriate. So. Um, I spent an afternoon on uh, the web. I love Google. I got about 47,000 million hits mm -hmm. for a regulation of um, bars and taverns. Um, and what I did, and then working with um, the manager, we've put together um, a draft um, amendment which covers um, a few items. Um, it provides a definition of what is a bar um, or a tavern. It provides um, a structure for the planning board to consider whether it should be a permitted use, and if so, in what zones should it be a permitted use. Um, it um, addresses seating and parking. It does include um, a ban on um, happy hour discounting of alcohol on outdoor seating and live entertainment. Um, I'm not wedded to any of these things, but as I spoke with um, Maureen O'Meara, she suggested to me that it would be very important for us to have a discussion about these items. And um, in that way, the um, planning board can have some guidance as well, should we decide tonight to refer this to the planning um, board. So. Um, what I have is a draft regulation, and what I will be asking the council to do is to refer the item to the planning board. But I think it would be appropriate and in order for us to also discuss it to the extent that anyone has any initial feelings. And I also respect that you may not have any initial feelings because you might want to hear from the planning board first. Now, I know there are also people here who would want to speak about it. So maybe before we have the council discussion, I'll just say if there's anyone from the public who would like to address um, this topic, um, now would be the time to discuss that. I uh, would ask you, um, it's not a public hearing. Um, if and when something is referred to the planning board and it comes back from the planning board, there will also be a formal public hearing. Um, so I would ask you to come to the um, podium and state your name and address and, um, and try to be brief because, as I said, there will be a public hearing if we ever get to the point of adopting something. But. So, and it's helpful sometimes if there's more than a few people to form a line um, of sorts so that it can be efficient. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Morris Kreitz. 
Um, I live at 524 Ocean House Road. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, there's an effort being made to uh, clarify what is a restaurant as opposed to what is a bar. Um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that just the fact that uh, a draft ordinance is being written to regulate bars presupposes that there ought to be bars in Cape Elizabeth. So I was happy uh, to hear you say, Ms. Lynch, that, um, that we're not there yet. We haven't yet decided whether there were, in fact, ought to be bars in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm especially concerned, uh, I, I personally don't, don't think that there's any place in Cape Elizabeth where a bar would be helpful um, or help property values or anything like that. I'm especially concerned about bars being allowed in neighborhood business districts or I guess what are known as the BA districts in town. There are, there are two such districts, um, one out on 77, goes from Rudy's up to uh, uh, the Kettle Cove ice cream store, and the other is on Shore Road. It goes from um, the intersection of Shore Road and Preble Street down to the uh, South Portland line. Both of these are small islands. They're in, in the midst of residential areas. As a matter of fact, I looked on the maps and, and I it looks to me as if there's not a single property in either of the neighborhood business zones that is not either adjacent to or directly across the street from one or more homes. So these are small geographical areas. Uh, the stated objective, or one of the stated objectives of a BA zone is to uh, permit businesses that are compatible with the neighborhood that they abut. Um, it's my opinion that a bar, uh, which I think the reality is that bars uh, like to um, invite people to come together to, um, to purchase and drink alcoholic beverages. I think also it's a fact that bars <coughs> um, want to be open late at night. Uh, I think that any business that encourages traffic uh, late at night, that encourages noise, or not encourages, but would contribute to noise and commotion late at night, is inherently incompatible with the homes that are virtually next door. Um, so I would urge uh, that the, the draft amendment uh, at, at the very least, be changed so that the, the uh, neighborhood business zones or the BA zones are not included in the areas in which a bar is permitted. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Foley. I live at 511 Ocean House Road, immediately abutting the BA zone. I want to thank you for starting this very important discussion tonight about a very important issue in our town. My personal choice would be to prohibit bars and taverns in Cape Elizabeth. If the town council decides that bars and taverns do have a place in town, then the only place that should be is in the town center business district only and with very, very, very strict guidelines in place. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm Jane Snearson. I live at 7 Salt Spray Lane. About 25 years ago, I decided I wanted to move to Maine. And I looked from Kennebunk to Camden. And I am now more convinced than ever that I chose the right town to live in. I never lived in a small town before. I never had the, the luxury of being able to address a council and being able to have some input in what happens in my community. 
If I had wanted a bar at the corner, I probably would have selected, I no, unquestionably would have selected another community. And I'm, I'm grateful. I sat and I listened to ski trails, and I listened to library, and I listened to all kinds of wonderful things at these meetings. A bar just doesn't seem to fit in what my concept is of Cape Elizabeth. I hope that we can maintain the Cape that I've come in the last 20 years to love. And if indeed a bar is something that the community decides that belongs here, I agree with the last gentleman, I think it belongs in the town center, in the lot next door or, or someplace, rather than at the corner of, of my residential neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Fishbein, Salt Spray Lane. Um, like the other speakers so far, I very much appreciate the fact that you're now taking on this issue. The fact that we had no ordinances dealing with bars and taverns, I think, is something that nobody realized because we never really had a need for this before. But it creates a pretty substantial vulnerability. We're one of the only communities in southern Maine that has no regulations on this issue. So it's absolutely essential that you address this and you address this quickly. I also agree very strongly that if there are to be bars in Cape Elizabeth, they should be only in the downtown business district. That's consistent with what other communities do. It's also consistent with what's suggested by state liquor licensing regulations when you read them. They seem to favor that as a location. Neighborhood business districts that have recently been defined in the draft purpose statement as housing businesses that are consistent with and complementary with the neighborhoods they are in should not be a place for bars. It's hard to come up with a reason how a bar could be complementary uh, to a neighborhood business district. However, if you do go ahead and regulate bars and therefore by extension essentially endorse the concept of bars in town, I, I would suggest that you add some additional uh, regulation to your guidance to the planning board. Um, I think the ordinance should be comprehensive. There are other communities, if you look at other communities in the area, Portland, for example, uh, uh, the ordinances are many pages long. They're very detailed. They provide substantial protection uh, to the community. I also think that the definition of a bar needs to be much more detailed. Um, in addition to a 50% revenue test, any serving of alcohol to patrons who are not seated at a table consuming a meal uh, should define the establishment as being a bar, regardless of the amount of revenue. And that should include uh, serving alcohol with no or only incidental food. Also, the revenue requirement should only apply to the portion of the establishment that actually is the bar during the hours that the bar is open. And the denominator should not include other uh, revenues from other portions of the business. Uh, also, um, in addition to uh, serving people who are not seated eating a meal. Uh, any serving of patrons who are standing or at bar stools should also define the establishment as a bar. Hours of operation, regardless of where in town you decide that these should be, should be very limited. This is a neighborhood community. I would suggest that alcohol not be served prior to 4 p.m. and in no case should it be allowed past 9 p.m. You probably know that the state liquor licensing allows bars to remain open until 1 a.m. But towns can regulate hours very differently, and that should be part of this regulation. I presume most people wouldn't think that we should have bars all over town that are open until 1 in the morning. Um, we should be very specific on noise, outdoor seating, and public safety. As is suggested in the draft, there should be no outdoor serving of alcohol. There should be strict regulations on noise. The bars themselves should be responsible for noise, including by patrons in parking lots coming and going. And I'd also suggest that the bar be responsible for any public safety issues. There, it, it, in this time of great budget constraints, it does not seem fair to impose upon the taxpayers the additional public safety expense that almost invariably goes along with bars. There will be additional police expense. There will be enforcement expense. All of that should be the responsibility of the bar itself. And the bar should be responsible for the conduct of its patrons. Um, also, bar and tavern site plans should be required to be renewed annually. Other communities do this. There should be no long-term automatic uh, renewals. And the, the regulation should be very clear that gaining a renewal is um, conditional on the performance during the year. 
So if there are numerous complaints, noise violations, code enforcement violations, law enforcement incidents, that should be accumulated in a report compared to standards that should be set in the ordinance. And renewal of the license, meaning a site plan for authorization, should be conditional on successful performance. And finally, bar and tavern site plans should not be something that become an asset that can be transferred from one owner or one operator to another. So much of what will happen at a bar and tavern will be dependent on the operator, him or herself. So if someone uh, chooses to sell or lease a bar to someone else, there should be a new site plan application, which could be uh, done on a conditional basis to facilitate a sale. Um, and then just a couple of other quick thoughts. You may also want to consider, as Portland does, putting a limit on the number of bars or a limit on the number of bars in any one area. You might decide maybe there shouldn't be more than three bars in the town center or more than two or, or you could certainly come up with regulations on that. And you should also consider maximum number of seats. Site plans currently are based on number of seats but not number of patrons. The only regulation of number of patrons apparently is the fire uh, codes. So you probably should be very specific on the number of patrons that would be allowed to be served in, in a bar at any given time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Patrick Babcock, Cape Elizabeth. Thank you as well for allowing me to uh, speak on this. And thank you for your time and consideration uh, on this issue as well. You mentioned that you looked up on Google um, with the elements of a bar, what makes a bar, what constitutes a bar, the permitting and, and what have you. Um, my question to this town council is do we not already have a bar in Cape Elizabeth, right lo located in Rudy's as we speak? And that's a huge concern of mine that slowly but surely in Cape Elizabeth we're allowing these processes to maybe go by the wayside and before you know it you have one thing that some, maybe someone's overlooked or done the old wink, wink, nudge, nudge kind of a thing, and that opens up a whole can of worms, and before you know it, someone's grandfathered in, the next one's grandfathered in. Before you know it, we have a, a situation on our hands where we really haven't slowed down for a moment and taken a look at exactly what we're fast-tracking right now in regard to this bar and tavern issue. Um, quite frankly, I, I, I hope that I can speak eloquently on the topic because I live right next door to... Rudy's, well, I would say about five houses up, and um, I actually work in the field of uh, chemical dependency and addiction. It's been something that's been um, pretty impactful in my life for a long time, and there's an element right now where our community, I think, is doing the old ostrich in the sand when we want to talk about uh, what the ordinance is, or the BA wetlands this, or, what, you know, again, what constitutes something. I really want to adjust the elephant in the room. We're talking about a bar. And we're talking about a bar in an environment that, first of all, I, I see my neighbors. I know the people who own the homes directly north and south of Rudy's. A, a majority of us in that immediate visual area, that walking environment, are not in favor of having a bar in our environment. So if you're going to eliminate uh, a portion of the walking population to a bar, and we're talking about Route 77 here, after all, which everyone in this room and who's watching on TV knows is pretty much our one road in and out of town. If we're going to allow for a bar to be in that one location, and, and right now we have a bar there, in my opinion, I don't know if I need to say uh, you know, some sort of legal term there, but there's a bar right down the street from me, and it's wintertime in Maine, and we're all safe here, and it's kind of cozy, and the locals go there now, but let's face it, when the summer rolls around and tourist season starts up on 77, and uh, a neon light sign goes on out there, and, and, and Rudy's is allowed to stay up till 1 o'clock, and the construction workers from the daytime are meeting the beach goers and the tourists from the nighttime, you're going to have a huge environment where, it's, and I was quoted in the century as calling it a DUI machine, and where I'm inviting all of my tourist family, friends, and what have you to come up and perhaps go walk down to the ice cream shack and enjoy what we all pretty much live and moved here for, or were born here, and, and gladly, you know, remain here for, uh, those elements, we're now going to have to negotiate, most likely, uh, I can't imagine that we're, we're, we're thinking of any other uh, situation on our hands, 
people pulling out, screeching, you know, getting in their car, legally over the limit, immediately putting on loud bass music with all kinds of stuff behind their uh, pickup trucks or what have you, pulling back in a small traffic environment, which clearly is another issue that I have no legal or eloquent, uh, you know, uh, ability to speak on. I'm just speaking on the practical matter of, as I have my family members or my friends bring their children and as we're walking to perhaps the ice cream shack, you know, what kind of odds are we increasing right now by considering a bar in the neighborhood of 77 around that environment? Uh, one thing I would just like to point out, and, and there's a longer list that, you know, perhaps in, in that next uh, forum I'd, I'd be happy to share uh, with the town council that, that is representative of the, the, our larger neighborhood's concerns. But one thing I would like to ask of you, you know, at this moment here, what's the legacy that we're going to leave in Cape Elizabeth as patrons of this, uh, of this town now and the town council? What is the legacy you're looking to leave for generations and generations to come? The, the, the Native Americans, you, you know, I've heard, have tried to make decisions based on what, or try to make decisions based on what the impact would be seven generations from now. By not regulating bars now, what are we perhaps doing for residents of Cape Elizabeth one, two, three, seven generations from now? Are we not just going to turn it into what appears to be just another potential Old Orchard Beach? And if people in Shore Road don't think that this is coming their way if we don't regulate, I would you know, suggest they guess again. So I, I would please ask that uh, you know, some sort of regulation that prior people have spoken about be addressed uh, before it's too late. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would ask that everyone keep their comments to about three minutes. Um, if it is referred to the planning board, there will be ample time there. Um, and, and certainly in three minutes, I know you can all share with us your thoughts. Um, I, and I do just want to clarify, there is no railroading of, or fast tracking of anything. Um, I was as shocked as anyone to find out that there were no ordinances regulating bars. Um, so as I looked at it, I realized there was a vacuum um, in our regulatory structure. Um, but uh, no one is being asked to fast track anything. And this is the beginning of our normal um, and usually somewhat slow process to um, amend the zoning ordinances. So I just want to be clear to the extent that anyone thinks there's a fast tracking going on. There's not. <laughs> Gail? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gail Schmader, and I live at 511 Ocean House Road. I agree we need an ordinance in place providing advisability and or guidelines for bars in Cape Elizabeth. I agree with Mary Ann that there is a vacuum here. Um, this needs to be in place, in my opinion, before any action is taken on the wetland setback in the BA. Um, Cape Elizabeth is a small rural town. It's not a place for bars or taverns, especially in BA zones abutting residential neighborhoods. Um, Rudy's, an existing commercial property in the BA, has ever so <coughs> gradually changed into a late afternoon and evening bar or tavern. Um, it's interfering with the privacy rights of peace of a very quiet neighborhood. It would be very different if new residential construction abutted an already noisy commercial property. This is not the case here. The neighborhood has been here since the 1950s, and Rudy's has been a variety store and luncheonette since the 1960s. Acting on the wetlands before the bar, tavern, and BA design and business guidelines are in place pave the way for unrestricted changes to existing businesses. Please, and I fully believe that you are, work thoughtfully and carefully to protect the quality of life in our town. Let us leave a legacy to our children that we can be proud of. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Gail. Hello, I'm Lee Beatty, and I live at 501 Ocean House Road, and I just want to express my concern um, as you develop the ordinance in dealing with bars and taverns that you take into consideration, again, as others have said, the quality of life in Cape Elizabeth and um, consider our quiet neighborhood and give it as much thought as you can. Is there a mic on there? No. Thank you. There's a mic that just hangs and will pick up your voice. Uh, I'll 
usually I, I talk too loud anyway, so I don't, don't have a problem. I, I just like to say that I, I really enjoy having a neighborhood store and diner, but, but I don't, I'm very concerned about having a bar in a neighborhood. And it seems to me that uh, for all the reasons that, I've, that all these other folks have, have said, for, you know, for many of those reasons, and also it seems to me that a bar in a neighborhood like that, if it has a benefit, it would be minimal and occasional. But the detriments, I think, would be substantial and constant for, uh, for most of the homeowners around the uh, site. By the, I live at 501 Ocean House Road as well, so I'm And your name is, I'm sorry? BA neighborhood. Pardon? And sir, your name is? Brad Strauss. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, and then ju just finally, I think in a, in, in a neighborhood, the concerns of a homeowner should always take precedence over concerns of business. And uh, I was attracted to Cape Elizabeth because it seemed to be a community that shared those type of values. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Carl Best. I live at 12 Pondview Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, the news when we found out that there was a bar close by to us uh, was quite a surprise. I think it was for everybody in our neighborhood. Unfortunately, not a pleasant surprise. Um, my wife and I are real familiar with the, uh, with the bar industry, with uh, you know, the good things it has to offer a community and, uh, and certainly the downside. Uh, myself having worked in that industry for a number of years and with uh, family members who are owner operators for as many as 30 years, uh, believe me, we're, we're very familiar with, with the ins and outs of things like that. And, and I'm a little concerned and uh, happy that we're talking about this and having the opportunity to set forth some regulations because I think it's needed. Um, I hope that when you're considering the issue that you will uh, maybe consider it from the standpoint of what if this were happening in my neighborhood. And uh, while you're not maybe living in the direct vicinity that we are, um, you know, certainly I think that uh, it's part of our community and uh, it has to be dealt with and it's a reflection on all of us. And uh, I think we can deal with it in a, in a good way. Um, but, uh, you know, again, my concern here is a, is a selfish one. It's all about property value for us. And uh, I just would hope that a single business uh, is not necessarily permitted to undermine the property value of an entire neighborhood. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Carl Dittrich, 500 Ocean House. In the same neighborhood, I'm going to be the bad guy and speak on the other half. What I've seen, my thoughts. Keep in mind, I would mention everyone that um, In by the Sea with a $17 million addition is also having the, a bar or lounge, whatever you'd like to call it, that's going to seat 18 people with my friend living right across the street. They also do have large weddings where people drink out on the lawn about every weekend couple of weddings a weekend. Uh, the Good Table, beautiful little place. If you look in the old Cape Couriers from last summer, they advertise porch bar. Um, and they also serve hard liquor, where the place that people are mentioning does not have a hard liquor license. Um, seeing from the inside a little bit, um, teachers, teachers' aides, special ed teachers, coaches, firemen, policemen, general practitioners, oral surgeons, anesthesiologists, electropsychologists, cardiologists, I don't even know what some of these ologists are. <laughs> the, these are patrons, attorneys, IT people, architects, insurance salesmen, undertakers, farmers, and I could go on and on and on. There is a group of people in the town which consider it um, like it would be in Europe as a third place. First place being your home, second place being your business. You can't have a neighborhood pub, bar, whatever you want to call it, social hub we've heard, if it's not in a neighborhood. Um, if you were thinking green um, and thinking safety and thinking about neighbors, it's a lot easier, because people leave busy lives, to go up to the corner place to meet with your neighbors and have a drink, not going over the bridge, not driving your SUV, if you did the math, the amount of gas and fuel saved. I mean, there's different aspects of it. 
Uh, I guess I'm speaking from the, the bad guy perspective. But what I see in there is people saying, haven't seen you in 20, 30 years, I, you know, blah, 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 how's the family? It's the only place in town where you can go and socialize. I see, if I go into the good table, you'll see a family, and you'll say, hi, how you doing, how are the kids, blah, 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 then you'll sit down, you don't talk to them again. A little minute at the IGA, a little minute um, at the dump, but it's one place where um, it seems very relaxed and fine. Um, I think the image is during the day there, you see a lot of pickup trucks. And all those pickup trucks are building the inn by the sea and building bonus rooms off people's houses and additions and all that kind of thing. Those people, they're gone at 4 o'clock. The idea of what we'd call the riffraff and yahoos coming from Portland to Cape Elizabeth to a neighborhood bar that just serves beer and wine, I think is far-fetched. And, and summertime people, they're spending two to three thousand dollars to rent a house here. Um, they're not the kind of people that we're imagining. Uh, I, I just don't see it. My idea is if, if they think it was going to be, if we advertise bikers night, the only thing you would see there is guys in little shorts and cloppity things coming off their bicycles. It's really a slice of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, uh, the world is not flat. I would say, you know, go there on a Friday night, check it out. It's, um, it's pretty mellow. I live right in the neighborhood. If it's noisy, if it's loud, I'll be the first one to complain. I'll be right back here saying, close it down. It's, it's ridiculous, and um, it should be closed. But I, if I, the one last thing I would say is that there's a, what I would call a ginormous building being built closer, you know, closer to the, the buildings that are already there. I would think the owners of that, they're spending a million dollars to build this four condominiums, two commercial businesses. I think they would be the number one concern because they're trying to sell condominiums that are going to overlook this place. And I think you have in your records a letter from the owner saying he doesn't really have a problem with it. So I would just, I'd be a little concerned about making rules and regulations because it's going to go for all the, the places that serve beer and wine and no one's mentioned the lobster shack where you're allowed to bring whatever you want and consume what, as much as you want while you enjoy your lobster and drive up Two Lights Road um, any way you want. Thank, Thank you, you, Carl. Okay. I'm Mary Page. I live at 172 Two Lights Road. And there seems to be a lot about this tonight. Um, I own Rudy's of the Cape at 517 Ocean House Road. And this has just been totally blown out of proportion. People, this place has been in business for 50 years. It's gone through a few owners in its time. Um, the only thing that's different about this establishment is it serves beer and wine. It's still a restaurant, it's still a pizza parlor, it's still a family place. We still sell candy and ice cream to the kids that ride their bikes up in the summertime. We just incorporated beer and wine. Instead of selling it to go, where people can grab it and go drink it in their car and drive away, we now sell it in-house with food, a lot of food, and very minimal on the alcohol. We do not have a liquor license, we have a beer and wine, a spirits license. We do not intend to get a liquor license, to be reassured on that. Um, a lot of people, I, I hear a lot of things, and I've seen a lot of the letters, and it's very hurtful. Nobody's come to speak to me in regards to this. We're doing our best to try to stay afloat, to try to keep this business in town. It's not as easy as it looks. And you know, to do everything you have to do to maintain a reputation, it's a lot of work. And I need a lot of people, and a lot of people depend on me to pay their mortgages, to pay their car payments, to take care of their kids. It's a whole, it's a whole in itself, a whole community in itself. And people really need to sit back and take a look at this because we're not going to have screeching tires. We're not going to have neon lights. We're not going to have people going around at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's a simple little place where you can come on a Saturday afternoon or a Tuesday afternoon after you're done mowing your lawn, you don't feel like cooking, you don't feel like taking a shower, you want to order a pizza and sit down and have a beer. Bring the family. You can do that. That's all it is. It's not, we're not swinging from disco balls in the ceiling. It's not that type of place. 
It's a family gathering place. And for your neighbors to meet your neighbors, to meet new people, to meet old people, and people really need to sit back and to think about what they say before they say it because they need to come down, they need to see, they need to look at it. The majority of the people here that spoke this evening have all been here, have all been there, and have all enjoyed it, and have all raved about it. But I incorporate beer and wine into my menu, along with my food and my pizza, and all of a sudden, I'm a bar. I'm not a bar. I'm a restaurant that serves beer and wine, just as the good table, just as the Sea Glass Lounge will be, just as Ocean House Pizza is, just as Portland South, South Port and House, House of Pizza is. That's all it is. And it really needs to tame down and people need to find out information before they start getting all rubbed up about it because it's just, it's just kind of hurtful and not nice. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Hello, I'm Danica Babcock and I'm at uh, 503 Ocean House Road. Um, I guess it's interesting to hear about what Mary has to say and uh, in looking at this as an issue for our neighborhood, the thought keeps getting back to it's not a personal situation at all. Uh, from my perspective, it's just a great opportunity to make sure that the decisions that are made protect the neighborhood and set forth what the, the new comprehensive plan is supposed to set forth with the BA districts and what should be allowed in those districts and how they should uh, benefit the town. So all of the things that are being described are great and you can, have, I, uh, pe you can have people who mean what they say about what they're looking to do but the, uh, there should be ordinances in place for if the property changes ownership or it's just logical stuff that towns put forth to make sure that the uh, citizens are protected especially when it's in a neighborhood. So I would hope that people understand that and consider that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jan Corey, and I live in South Portland, quite close to the cookie jar, but not but on the South Portland side. Um, but I am a, a personal representative of a home two houses up from Rudy's. And my folks bought it, my father was 85, and the trend is to keep your parents at home. And so we bought the property and said, oh, look, a cute little country store, you can get a loaf of bread, quarter milk, whatever. Okay, and then it changed. But to address, to address what Mary was saying, a family restaurant usually doesn't stay open till one o'clock. And I believe she was quoted in one of the news, current newspapers saying her intention was to stay open to one. Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to say was that I looked through the state statutes today and I was trying to under liquor licenses and they did not have the term bar at all. Instead, they had the tr just classified the different restaurants and the only restaurant that mentioned a tavern was a class four. So just an FYI. Thank you very much. Okay. Council, what say ye? Oh, is there someone else? I'm sorry. I won't say much. Okay. Because I'm scared. You shouldn't be scared. We're quite harmless. <laughs> <laughs> We're truly harmless. <laughs> we, mo we moved out here 51 years ago, or almost 51 years this summer. Oh, your name, please? Oh, Fern Orr. I live at 505 Ocean House Road. We had a two-year-old son and a three-week-old daughter when we moved out here, and we loved the quiet and the serenity. There was no... Bagley store then. There was no that Bagley's and then Rudy's came later. And we'd like to see that type of neighborhood maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't know if anyone would like to make a motion before we have any discussion, if we need any discussion. Well, I have a question. Have you 
Why do you recommend it being um, referred to the planning board and not the ordinance committee? Because the zoning, uh, our, our town requires that everything that uh, is an amendment to the zoning ordinance must go to the planning board first. And then it will come back to us, and then we will actually refer it to the ordinance committee at that point in time. So it will, it will end up in the ordinance committee, but the zoning, proposed zoning amendments always go to the planning okay. board first. Thank you. Just a question. Sarah? When will the public hearing be? Will there be one with the planning well, board stage? The planning board often Everyone has... Everyone needs to speak up. The planning board often has public hearings, and I imagine they would on this. Should we refer it to them? Still waiting for a motion to refer it. And well, I, I would like to refer this item to the planning board uh, for, for the following reasons. Or I'll wait for a second, and then I could state my reasons. OK. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And my reasons are that, first of all, a citizen has requested it. I know you're the citizen, but I sense there are many other citizens, too. And it seems to me that, based on um, what I've heard this evening, that there are, uh, there's a significant amount of interest um, in this topic by a significant number of citizens. And so I would like to hear, since we have, as you said, a vacuum at the moment, I would like to hear what the Planning Board has to say about this. I am sympathetic to the issues raised by the residents in the area. I am also sympathetic to um, Mary Page's efforts to maintain her business, but I think we have to, uh, we as a community have to balance all those various needs, and so that's why I'd like to refer to the Planning Board to hear what their thoughts are. Okay. Any further discussion? Well, I have a question. I mean, I, as a, um Town Council, I recall that we approved the license of Rudy's to sell beer and wine. And um, I guess my question is, it, are, is this going to be a prospective um, <coughs> ordinance that will apply, or is this to address what was a mistake on the part of the Town Council, in your opinion? Well. That's a good question. Um, I think that you need to speak up. I think that when we were asked to look at that change, and there was a liquor license to sell packaged goods, and we were asked to um, change the liquor license to allow um, sales on the premises, and then there would no longer be sales of packaged goods. At least, just speaking for myself. I thought it would be more akin to what happened at Ocean House Pizza. People come in, they sit down, they order their pizza, maybe they get a glass of wine or a beer. Um, I don't think any of us envisioned that a, a physical bar would be constructed and people would sit and, or stand and have alcohol and not have it be part of a meal. So um, there was a a ruling by the um, code enforcement officer that there was no change in use. Um, no one appealed that ruling in a timely fashion. Um, I'm not sure legally where that leaves the bar. I certainly haven't looked at the legal question, but as all of us have done, I've read the letters that we've had from a number of people, and I just was surprised to see that, yes, we do have bars in town. We have a bar at Perpudic. We have a bar at the Inn by the Sea. We have a bar, very small, at um, the Good Table. Um, what makes this different? Should it be different? Do we need some regulation? Should there be outdoor seating? Um, so that's what's motivating me, is um, we don't really have a regulatory scheme, but is it fair we have some bars in some places? Um, but I can't answer your question about where Rudy's is, what kind of legal limbo it is or it isn't in. I haven't looked at that issue. I've just looked at the issue that we don't have an ordinance. And so I'm sorry if I can't shed more light on it. No, that's fine. Thank you. Paul? I, 
am struck by the comments that have been made because I hear two different perspectives, entirely different perspectives. And I, and I appreciate both. I think uh, the neighbors are concerned about the environment, you know, in which they live. They're concerned about noise and other issues that center around a typical bar. And I hear Mary, and she says that's not what her intention is. So we have two different viewpoints, completely different viewpoints, on this same location. And, and that concerns me because there's no, it's not very clear. You know, we, I think um, if I understand properly, Mary went through a process with the planning board, if I'm not mistaken, and with the town planner and went to, or, or came up with a plan. Am I, am I incorrect? Because the code enforcement officer ruled that there was no change in use, I don't believe the planning board Okay. Ever ruled on. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman. What, what happened, in, and I think what Councillor McKenney might be referring to, is the, the owner of the particular property that you mentioned, uh, Mary Page, uh, was applying to the planning board, and, and there was, a, I believe, a planning board workshop on a proposal to, to change the site plan in conjunction with the hopes to have an outdoor uh, seating area and, and some other improvements to the property. Uh, that she was proposing. Uh, that was already to go forward, and then the, the BA wetland issue came up that, uh, in essence, made all of the properties in, in that particular zone non conforming uses. And at this process, even though many of those plans are drawn up and completed, working with the planner and with the owner of the property, it's, uh, it's all being held in abeyance uh, and has been ruled. That, that it cannot be applied for because it would be an expansion of a non-conforming use in a, in a BA wetland. I, I guess that, that clarifies it to some extent. Thank you, Michael. I, um, I'm still perplexed because I'm hearing two sides of an issue and it doesn't seem like there's any place where they meet. It, and, and that bothers me. And I don't know how, to, you know how that can be corrected. Maybe the planning board can do that. But, um, that concerns me because everybody who spoke, everybody who spoke, is lives in that same area, and I think um, it's it's unfortunate when there's a misunderstanding. So maybe there's some clarification that can take place uh, between them, and I hope so. But uh, I don't think any of us, at least I'll speak for myself, are in favor of having a bar in town. I don't think anybody has that intent, um, and I I think there. Are, you know, the perspectives, there's, there's some miscommunication at some point here, and I don't know where it lies exactly, but that concerns me. Sarah? I think it would be extremely helpful to clear up the topic that several people brought up of um, location, like districts, where it's allowed and where it's not allowed, and I wonder at what point along the process will that be wrestled with? Well, that's in the draft. So ordinance that would, that would go to the planning board and what we're essentially asking the planning board to do is wrestle with that as a first cut and then um, as I mentioned the planning board would send it back to us and then we send it to our ordinance subcommittee so it will get addressed at, as it goes through the process but it is very much a part of my draft um, and again I want to be clear um, my draft was for the purposes of getting a town and planning board discussion going of the topic. I certainly have no um, strong feelings on where bars should or should not be located, other than to say there are already some bars in town, and I do have a strong feeling that we need to be um, fair. So um, it seems like to pass this along to the planning board would is beneficial to both sides of this debate, right? Because sort of both sides are saying, we want more clarification, we want more rules, we want to know what to do and how to go forward. I mean, Mary Page clearly needs to know that, and all the neighbors want to know that. So what's the downside of not moving this along in a much more lengthy process where everyone can be heard? And I, I don't see any downside to moving, to, to referring. 
<laughs> Michael's telling me it's a rhetorical question, but I don't know that there's a, uh, yeah, I guess what I don't I'm saying that is it seems there's like a downside. We need to talk, more. Need to talk more. Yeah, That's so. right. So let's pass it. <laughs> so, David. I, I, I'd like to thank Councillor Lynch for making the effort to put together sort of the first draft, which I read as sort of a list of issues to be addressed uh, rather than a specific proposal for how it should be addressed. Yes. Um, and I am in favor of the planning board looking at this, and I would just encourage the planning board when they take a look at it to look at not only the issues that are presented by the, various, by the, by the draft Councilor Lynch has put together, but any other issues that they think are appropriate to address as part of the broader picture. Um, and um, I'm sure that they will do that in the context of input that will be received from everybody who's spoken here tonight um, and others. And I would just say, I, th I think it's very timely because the comprehensive plan, which we adopted about a year ago now, I can't. October. October. I guess time doesn't fly as fastly as I thought. Um, so the comprehensive plan, one of the uh, things that the comprehensive plan said was we need to have um, criteria for the BA districts. And what's happened in that particular end of town where nothing happened for 40 years, all of a sudden there's a lot of stuff happening before we go out and do the design criteria, but the planning board is having a workshop on Wednesday night on the design criteria um, and criteria for businesses in the BA zone. So um, I would encourage those of you who are here tonight to attend the planning board workshop, which will be Wednesday night. And I think this is just a subset of a larger set of issues that they're going to be working through. Uh, Marianne, I just wanted to say that um, I would encourage the neighbors and the business owner to, if they haven't, to sit down and talk. And, and you may not come to any agreement, but I'd encourage you to do that because then I think you can get an understanding of one another and maybe come to some consensus that may be workable. I don't know. I just want to put that out. Okay. Thank you. Is there further discussion? We've had a motion and a second. Seeing none, all in favor of referring this to the planning board? That would be 7-0, Ruthie. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And again, I encourage um, all of you to go do the planning workshop. Uh, the next item on our agenda is item 51, proposed Riverside Cemetery fee adjustments. And there is a schedule of proposed fees, new fees in your package. And I, Michael, do you have anything to say on this? No, these are as recommended okay. by the trustees of the cemetery. A motion would be in order. Jim? I'd move that the proposed fees for the Riverside Cemetery be adopted as uh, included in our packets this evening. And is there a second? Second. Sarah, um, any discussion? David? I only had one question, and it had to do with the fee of $1,300 which is for disinternment for a full-size internal relocation. Now, I sort of understand that to be moving from one grave site to another within the cemetery. Yes. And I just wondered why an, an internment is $600. Um, a disinternment to pick up a grave and move it to a cemetery elsewhere is $650. Why wouldn't disinterment and moving it within the cemetery be the same price as a disinterment plus an internment. In other words, $1,250 instead of $1,300. That, that was the recommend. It's only a $50 difference as you've described it, Councilor Bagger. I, I just Bagger. wondered if there was a reason for that. I, I, you know, assume, I, I, David, I, could I say, assumed it was two holes. They have to dig it up once that, and then dig it up again. Yeah. David, there's usually a lot of wear and tear on the staff when the issues of re-internment come up within the cemetery. There are usually many other issues involved. It was more a question of, of curiosity as to why. I think we want to discourage it. Yeah. <laughs> just because. Yeah. The reason is just because. Yes. 
You're talking to a fellow counselor, not your ch child. <laughs> and one at a time to work. Okay. Okay. Is there further discussion? No. Seeing none. All in favor of the new fee schedule? That would be seven zero. Thank you. And the next item on our agenda is item 52, the Fort Williams Park use request. And uh, Mr. Shields, I believe, still Mr. Shields, has been doing this for years, has requested approval um, for the Pond Cove Elementary School to have their field day, um, which is actually multiple days on the week of June 9th to 12th. Um, and it's, we all, all those of us who've had children in Pond Cove know how much fun that is, so. A motion would be in order. Cynthia? Yes, I would move that we approve the use of Fort Williams Park by Pond Cove Elementary School for their field day on June 9th, 12, 2008. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Okay, 7 0. Okay. The next item on the agenda is item 53, and this is the annual dog warrant. Um, and we will be. Um, issuing warrants to prosecute owners and keepers of unlicensed dogs. Uh, we just ask if your name is on this list and your dog has sadly passed away um, to please let the town clerk mm -hmm. know. So, um, Jim. Uh, not seeing a mugshot of my own dog. Mm -hmm. uh, I will move that we approve the animal municipal warrant for prosecuting owners and keepers of unlicensed dogs. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. It's a vote. Okay, the next item is item 54, the Regional Forensic Lab, and that is a report from the Finance Committee. Jim? Uh, at one of our recent Finance Committee meetings, uh, Chief Williams from the Police Department, uh, actually before that, at, at our last town council meeting, uh, proposed that our town join in a uh, a con consortium with a consortium of other towns, local towns, uh, to have a regional uh, crime lab, which is which will be in the Portland Police Department. Uh, all the towns are asked to c contribute uh, based on population to the lab. Um, we discussed it in finance committee. Uh, Chief Williams assured us that uh, this is the way to go. Uh, it saves us a lot of uh, back and forth between Augusta, which is where the primary lab that we use now is. Um, the facilities will be local, the training will be better for our own officers, and it just uh, seemed to make a lot of sense. So uh, based on the discussions that we had in our finance committee meeting, uh, I would like to move that we enter into the regional agreement for a new forensic laboratory to be located at the Portland Police Headquarters. Is any further discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Okay, the next item is our uh, proposed municipal budget. Michael, do you want to do a presentation okay, with okay. Jim before? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I will move out of the way. No, you're not in the way. You can just turn around. I want to thank uh, Manager McGovern for putting together this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, well, I might not be in the way, but I can't see. So... Uh, again, thank you to uh, Manager McGovern for putting together this uh, PowerPoint presentation. This is it by, in, by no means a comprehensive uh, review of the budget, but it does uh, touch on the high points or, or low points, depending on your viewpoint, uh, this year. Uh, you've, you've read in the press, no doubt, it's not only in our town, but in communities throughout the state and, and in fact, the country, that this has been a particularly difficult year uh, to build a municipal budget. Uh, a number of uh, circumstances beyond our control have kicked in. Uh, there are some circumstances which we can control and we have tried to control, but it's been a very difficult process. Uh, but the process, I think, uh, as it always does or always seems to, has brought out the best in a lot of people. And I would like to thank uh, the other members of the Finance Committee, the Town Council Finance Committee, for the hours and, and the thoughtful consideration that they put into the building our town budget this year. Also, thanks go to the school board, the uh, school department, uh, the leadership team from the school department, uh, all of our municipal department heads, 
staff members, everybody that has contributed to the, uh, to the building of this budget, I want to thank. Um, click. <laughs> <laughs> the first page uh, of our budget is just a summary of the expenditure changes from the current budget, from the 2007-2008 budget. The changes from this year to the fiscal year 2009 budget, which is what we have been considering. As you can see, uh, the municipal budget uh, has increased by 3.4 percent, the school budget 4.6 percent, community services program 10.7 percent, county tax, over which we have no control, 7.8 percent, the homestead exemption, which is an exemption that applies to uh, homes that are owned by uh, local people, that are resided in by local people and have owned those homes for over a year, uh, minus 3.3 percent. The total general fund, 4.5 percent. Uh, the pie chart here uh, shows the revenue side, uh, income uh, to the town. This is our pot of money that we have to work with on the municipal side of the budget. As you can see, the, the vast majority of our income comes from property tax at 61 percent. Excise taxes are at 19 percent. And from then on, it goes down to state sources, uh, fees and permits, use of surplus, investment income, and other at 2 percent. Uh, this shows the uh, declining excise tax uh, revenues. It is a little misleading in that the bottom line is not uh, a zero base. It, uh, as you can see, the, the chart starts at 1.62 million and goes up to 1.82. So if you can picture whole uh, columns, these are just the tops of the columns. But it does reflect how excise taxes have dropped since 2006 to this budget year. This, uh, this chart is investment income. As you can see, uh, that in recent memory peaked in 2007 and has been declining since and quite dramatically this year. Uh, dropped to uh, about $100,000. The numbers aren't as big as they were with the, with the other uh, incomes, but nevertheless, the investment income upon which we rely fairly heavily has dropped, dropped significantly this year. Uh, now we, we'll flip over to how we spend our money, uh, how we use that pool of money. Uh, obviously, half of the money goes to payroll and benefits. The next highest category would be debt service or the money that we pay to borrow money. Uh, contracted services, trash fees, other. Uh, paving equipment is also uh, used to be known in former budgets as capital overlay, but uh, a little more descriptive and a little more understandable perhaps for the, for the citizens at large would be the term paving and equipment, so that's what that refers to. Municipal spending by area. Um, here we see that public works and public safety are fighting to see who can spend more or less, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, they're both at 21 percent, debt, ser uh, debt service at 14 percent, as is um, as our employee benefits, and they will kick down to some of the smaller uh, categories like parks and pool, library. Uh, again, you'll see uh, paving and equipment, uh, tax collection and administration, and so forth. Just a couple interesting facts on the budget at, 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 in whole. Uh, the municipal expenditures are up $286,700, or 3.4%. Debt service is up $129,287. Police and public works up $156,000, or 6.5%. And uh, savings to the expenditure column amounts to about $90,000 uh, due to the fitness center, proposed fitness center uh, privatization. Uh, it should be noted that of the $90,000 in, in expenditure savings, uh, part of that is recouped by uh, membership fees and so forth. So uh, it, it, that isn't all uh, loss. A uh, couple of interesting slides here. Uh, gasoline and diesel, as we all know, is, has gone through the roof. Uh, it has increased $33,110, which, if my math was correct, is about 38% uh, this year. Heat and salt, uh, $213,000, up $45,000, which I think is about 28%. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that we have a town dog. This is Sparky. Uh, 
it cost us $8,591 more this year to take care of Sparky than it, oh, wait a minute. Now this, uh, animal sheltering cost refers to uh, when we uh, round up dogs that have fallen on the, the wrong side of the law, uh, we are required by the state to take care of those dogs. There are a couple of options. Uh, one, we could provide uh, food and shelter locally, uh, but we'd have to pay for a kennel, we'd have to pay for staffing and so forth. Uh, the other uh, viable option, the one that we cho choose, is to send our animals uh, that we corral uh, to a facility where that, that handles several municipalities' uh, animals. Kind of an interesting statistic. Perhaps the hydrant should have been on Sparky's slide. <laughs> uh, portable toilets, $32,000 shared cost. Hydrants, $74,892. Library books, $32,000 we spend. Refuse disposal, $825,000. And this is an area that uh, the council is taking a more and more interest in. Paul McKenney has, has been very uh, adamant that we should take an interest, and, and I think he has swayed the rest of us that this is an area where we can really look for significant savings in our town budget. Uh, Councilor Lynch mentioned earlier that we should all be focusing on recycling in our homes. Uh, I think we're going to have a concerted effort to make sure these things get done in the municipal buildings as well. That's a lot of money. Fire prevention supplies, $1,500. Employment health insurance, $509,000. You'll recognize the old postcard of uh, Maine Medical Center. Cumberland County assessment, uh, $1,010,011. This assessment we have no control over. It's, it's put, given to our town, and we have to pay for it. It covers uh, the county jail primarily, the county sheriff's department and the civic center and several other smaller things, but those are the three major items in the county budget. Uh, where do we go uh, from tonight? Well, tonight we are going to set the budget for public hearing, which will be May 12th. Uh, the following uh, dates may be subject to changes uh, resulting from the school consolidation law, but as things stand right now, the town council will vote to adopt the budget on May 27th. And then the school portion of the budget will be sent to the voters for a June 10 uh, ballot. That coincides with the primary election date. If you would like to uh, get more detailed information on the municipal and school budgets, community services budgets, you may go to the town website, www.capelizabeth.com. Thank you again, Manager McGovern. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Michael. Now, Jim, do you have a motion? Matter of fact, I have several, but um, I'll start with one. Item number 55-2008. I would move that we accept the report of the Finance Committee on the proposed fiscal year 2009 municipal budget and to schedule a public hearing on Monday, May 12, 2008, at 7.30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed budget recommending $8,802,000 $90 in expenditures, which is an increase of $286,700, or 3.37%. Uh, $3,450,500 in revenues from sources other than the property tax, which is a decrease of $217,060, or 5.92%, with $5,351,590 to be borne by taxation which is an increase of $503,760, or 10.39%, with a projected tax rate of $4.04 per $1,000 of assessed valuation. Is there any discussion? We're just sending this to public hearing. For, is that right, $4.04? For the municipal. Tax increase rate, yes. Projected tax rate increase. No, that's just the municipal size. Oh, okay. Municipal, okay. okay. Yeah. municipal rate. Okay. Any other discussion? Questions? Seeing none, all in favor of setting this for public hearing? 7-0, thank you. Jim? Item 56-2008, fiscal year 2009 proposed education budget. It's recommended to accept the report of the Finance Committee, and I would move that we accept the report of the Finance Committee on the proposed fiscal year 2009 Cape Elizabeth School Department budget, and to schedule a public hearing on Monday, May 12, 2008, at 7.30 p.m. at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed budget recommending 
$19,656,037 in expenditures, which is an increase of $864,415, or 4.6%, $3,445,812 in revenues from sources other than the property tax, which is an increase of $211,326, uh, $211, or 6.53%, with $16,210,225 to be borne by taxation, an increase of $653,089, or 4.2%, with a projected property tax rate of $12.24 per $1,000 of assessed value. Second. Discussion? Again, this is just to set this for public hearing. All in favor? One, two. Three, four. Whew. <laughs> Opposed? One, two, three. Okay, four, three. And you have show Councillors Brow, Lennon, and Kayata. Opposed? Thank you. Swift Kayata. Swift Kayata. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Jim? Uh, Madam Chairman, with your permission and the permission of the Council, I would like to combine items number 57 2008 through 64. 64. I think uh, 65, and, I'm sorry, no? Uh, 66. 66. Through 66. Okay, so that would be a motion. To, them on block. This would be a motion to take them on block. Second. 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 Discussion? All in favor? That would be 7-0. Okay. Jim? Uh, I would move that we uh, approve budget, line, uh, budget items number 57-2008 through 66. number 66-2008 uh, as presented in our packets. Second. Discussion? All in favor? 7-0. And now we are on item 67. Item 67 um, is a request of a property owner um, dealing with, um, a, I guess, a zoning ordinance issue. And I am a close personal friend of the attorney, Attorney McGehee, who is here. And so although I do think that I could serve in an unbiased fashion, I am concerned about any appearance um, that might be improper, so I would ask to uh, recuse myself from this item. And uh, if you agree to that, then actually, I suppose I should let Jim chair the meeting from this point while we take a vote on my recusal. So. My first successful coup d'etat. <laughs> You don't know it's successful yet. <laughs> so I would ask to, to recuse myself from this. And I will leave while you vote on it. Should I chair from here or there? Maybe take a couple minutes. Take the chair. See, see how you play. May not. I might let you do this <laughs> The uh, town has received a request from. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, I would entertain a motion uh, to accept the recusal of uh, Councilor Lynch. So moved. Discussion. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. All in favor. <laughs> Item 67-2008. Uh, the town has received a request from Chuck Filiatas property owner on Shore Road to exclude flagpoles from the definition of structure and to provide a side yard and rear yard setback of five feet for flagpoles. Uh, are there attorneys here who would like to make comments? Very good. Please approach the podium. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Peggy McGehee and um, I'm here uh, with, I'm with Perkins Thompson and I'm here on behalf of Holland and Chuck Filiates, and uh, I must say, um, I just finished up a year or so ago being on the Falmouth Town Council, and uh, was expecting a very long meeting and appreciate uh, the efficiency with which you just went through your budget, <laughs> set it up. Um, 
Mr. Uh, Filiatas, Mrs. Filiatas, Chuck and Holland, uh, uh, I regret not being here. Um, actually, uh, it was my understanding that pro, it would be kind of a pro forma uh, moving it to a planning board, and I suggested that he wait until there would be a planning board meeting. Um, I didn't know that at the time there would be a letter in opposition. So uh, they do send their regrets, but um, uh, did have a chance to talk with uh, the town manager, and uh, he thought that maybe there would be some interesting background. So if uh, you wouldn't mind, I'll give you a few minutes of background of why this uh, request is being made. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, um, uh, so the story of the uh, Jeffrey Legalitis is actually kind of interesting. It's one of the reasons I like to practice law, is the history. I mean, his, uh, his family goes back in many, many generations, and great-grandfather was a potato farmer in the county, and uh, uh, he had, a, I mean, it's late 1700s, uh, other grandfather, was, great-grandfather was in Bar Harbor, or great-great-grandfather. Um, and uh, he himself was born in Lewiston. He's a Lewiston boy. And his parents were teachers in Lewiston. Uh, uh, his uh, father was in the Coast Guard and would go back and forth in front of the Cape Elizabeth uh, shore and would bring uh, his kids uh, to Portland Headlight. And back when he was a child, he uh, saw this house on Shore Road and said, that's my dream house. And I think it's kind of an interesting situation. Um, he uh, did uh, uh, become a successful doing film editing. Probably if you're on JetBlue and you see films, they're edited. They may have you know, started out there. And he uh, moved out of uh, Portland in 1999, found his, uh, his wife, decided he wanted to come back to Maine. And uh, guess what? His dream house was up for sale. And so he purchased it in uh, 2004, and they have been slowly renovating it. Um, uh, during this time and, and hope to move back full time uh, into late 2009. Uh, you know, why the flagpole? Uh, I asked him that, and he said his family has waved the American and the Maine flags for generations. His grandfather was a, a two star general and uh, uh, ret retired him um, after uh, serving in Second World War and waved the Maine flag and the American flag. Um, uh, his uh, father uh, was in the Coast Guard, as you know, and uh, waved the flag. And Chuck was the flag boy at Pettingville School in Lewiston. And uh, went, I don't know, I cannot imagine my son going early to uh, school every day to put up the flag and at the end of the day, take it down and fold it up in those neat triangle. But that's what Chuck did. And he has a son, and uh, that is what he wants to do. So. Uh, they've been finishing up their renovations, and I think it was um, last May, uh, he decided that done the landscaping, time to uh, do the kind of the, the finishing piece, and went to his neighbor, Mr. Nelson, and asked uh, if it would be okay to put up a flagpole. Mr. Nelson said, fine. And then his contractor went to Mr. Smith, I think you have a, a memo about that, and asked if he could put up a flagpole. And uh, Mr. Smith said, we've never regulated them. Kind of technically a structure, but sure. So uh, the flag was put up last uh, summer, and uh, on that day, uh, Mr. Nelson uh, did call the code enforcement officer and objected, and uh, he's entitled to object. Uh, a flagpole is technically defined as a structure. As it is, um, actually, uh, one could say that with um, the DEP regulations with a 75-foot setback. It was interesting, both, both Mr. Smith and uh, I called the DEP. Do you regulate do you, the five poles in the 75-foot setback? No. No, that's not what we do. Uh, you know, other, do we, does Falmouth? No. Uh, does uh, Portland? No. Uh, and uh, so uh, cons Cape Elizabeth has been consistent uh, with um, other municipalities. Not, that's not to say, Chris Van Yotis is here, I'm, and municipal attorney, I'm sure he'll correct me if there are setbacks. Um, but... Um, it, uh, one of the things I want to say about uh, Chuck and Holland is they're rule followers. I'm very accustomed to appealing notices of violation. It's just I don't want to be a violation of anything capable of the town I want to come live in. Um, if it was in the intention of this town and public policy to allow, and they've never regulated, the town has never regulated uh, the placement of flagpoles, uh, then it sounds to me like if we just go to the town council and ask for 
the change, then um, uh, we could um, uh, keep the flagpole where it is. Why does he care about where it is as opposed to moving it back 10 feet? I mean, yes, there was a lot of cement, and it's a big pole. It's got the lanyard. You know, if he wants to both get the both flags, why not just move it 10 feet? I hope that you have um, in your packet. By the way, I'm very impressed with the website where you can get these packets. Um, never had that when I was in the council. But in the packet, you'll see um, the pictures of the various flags of the Portland headlight. I love the one by Ed Hopper. Um, but if you look at the last one, it does show the picture of the um, Affiliatus property. And uh, you'll see a row of Rosa Ragosa. And at the end, you'll see that flagpole. And it's, um, that's what posted at the corner. You'll notice that a lot of people just post their, put their flagpoles in the corners of the property. That's where we have ours in Shabig Island. And uh, on the other side are trees. So by moving it 10 feet, it's going to be smack dab down the center, as opposed to, if you'll notice, with your Diaz, the flag's on the side and not in the center. So um, that's why he would like to keep it where it is. He would like to teach his son to raise the flag. And, um, and that's why we're requesting it. Uh, it seems to be... Uh, appropriate, uh, given that there are probably other uh, property owners in uh, Cape Elizabeth who um, uh, have their flag poles placed in a place that's uh, not uh, in compliance uh, with uh, this, new, this um, more technical interpretation. I, I think because um, this letter that was um, submitted to the council by uh, Chris Vaniotis on behalf of Mr. Nelson was submitted. I'd like to comment on that because I assume that he'll be speaking tonight. Uh, and one of the things I can say is that both Mr. Nelson and Mr. Filiates, when they talk to one another, when they correspond with one another, are civil. They let the arguments go to the, the attorneys, and I think that's sometimes uh, not happen, doesn't happen, and I think that's a, a healthy thing. Um, so you will see that uh, the objection is, is pretty severe, um, and it says, uh, don't, don't allow this change. Um, if uh, the five pole has glare, throws a shadow, um, poses safety issues, so do trees. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that that's, uh, those are compelling reasons uh, to, uh, to deny even having this uh, petition heard by the planning board. Uh, that's what I, we understood, is that the council would send this to hearing and uh, that there would be a full uh, discussion about the public policy considerations there. Um, we did hope that um, over the winter we could um, negotiate a, a, a purchase of a strip of land from Mr. Nelson that had been proposed by Mr. Nelson uh, last February. Uh, but that didn't work. So uh, uh, Chris cites uh, various inaccuracies. He says it's not 9.5 feet back from the property, it's 7 feet, and the rest of that. I, I mean, we could quibble about that, but I think uh, rather than go on, um, I uh, will we could, we could leave the surveyors arguing those little points. I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope, oh, I, get, I do have various ordinance provisions. I wasn't quite sure what background you were concerned about. I thought maybe it was the motivation personal story. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to be clear that this is not a hearing, right? So Correct. to the extent that Mr. Van Yotis is going to present information, I would just hope you would keep in mind that this is simply a referral to the planning board. So the merits and facts while interesting, they just be summarized. So I'm under. We'll have conference room. Yeah. Thank you. In which case, maybe I should have crossed off some of my comments. Sorry. No, it's fine. Oh, I said I don't want to now have a rebuttal and, you know, just. Thank you. It's appropriate. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman and members of the Council. I am Chris Baniotis, and I'm here representing Bruce Nelson, who lives at 890 Shore Road. And I understand this is the preliminary step in front of the Town Council. Uh, it's not a public hearing. 
so I will try not to take up a lot of time. And I, I thoroughly agree with Councillor Dill that this is not the place to get into a debate or a discussion about what kinds of discussions these neighbors have had with one another, certainly about any discussions about buying the property. But I would really like to focus uh, with the Council on uh, what we think is the basic policy issue here and also about procedure, and I'll try to do that in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, for Mr. Nelson, this is not personal, and it's certainly not about patriotism or lack of patriotism, and it's not about prohibiting flagpoles. It's uh, simply that Mr. Nelson objects, as he has, to having a structure, and this particular flagpole is a very substantial structure, uh, 30 feet high, uh, having that structure as close to his property line as it has been placed up until the time it was taken down in response to the decision of the code enforcement officer. The, um, the town council, as, as you know when you're considering a proposed zoning amendment or any kind of zoning, is really acting as the town's legislative body. You are you know, the functional equivalent of the state legislature at the town of Cape Elizabeth level. And uh, there's a process in your ordinance whereby the town council, when somebody is proposing a bill, so to speak, can essentially kill that bill in committee and say this is not going anywhere, there's no reason for us to go further with it. And that's in essence what we're asking you to do tonight. The ordinance says that when a zoning request comes in front of the council, the council gets a preliminary look at it, and during that preliminary look, has the opportunity to say there's no need even to refer this to the planning board, it should stop right here, we, the town's legislative body, are just not interested in pursuing this topic, so the bill doesn't go any further. The um, town of Cape Elizabeth has had the same definition of the word structure for decades. I can't tell you exactly how many decades, but I know at least two because I've been doing this for a number of years, as Ms. McGee indicated, I'm a municipal lawyer, and we have in our office uh, old copies of the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance going back at least to the 1980s, and in the 1980s version of the ordinance, the identical definition of structure was in the ordinance. And that's the town's policy. It, it's not whatever practice the code enforcement officer may have intentionally or inadvertently developed, and maybe the whole issue of whether a flagpole is a structure was never raised before. But the town's policy is embodied in the town's ordinance. And we think that policy is absolutely clear. The definition of structure, which Ms. McGeehy has uh, quoted in her letter to you, and I believe we've also referenced in our letter to the council, is anything, and I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to pick out bits and pieces of it, it's anything built for the support, shelter, or enclosure of persons, animals, goods, or property. Well, that's not a flagpole. But it also says anything constructed or erected with a fixed location on or in the ground exclusive of fences. And then it goes on to say the term includes structures temporarily or permanently located, such as decks and satellite dishes. So the only definition, I'm sorry, the only exception in the definition of structure in this ordinance, which has been in place now for decades, is fences. But all other kinds of things which are erected with a fixed location on or in the ground are structures. There's no exception for flagpoles. Uh, satellite dishes are expressly mentioned, but there is no exception, for example, if somebody wanted to build a built-in barbecue out of brick. I mean, that's a structure, and it would have to be set back, whatever setback requirement is required in a particular zoning district. So maybe flagpoles have kind of floated beneath the radar and haven't been an issue up until now, but when the issue came up, uh, the code enforcement officer consulted with the municipal attorney, who looked at it and said, yes, indeed, a flagpole is a structure. And as a structure, it has to meet the setback requirements in the zoning district. So that policy, we think, is clear because it been, has been in the town's ordinance for, for decades that only fences are excluded. And we respectfully suggest to the council that's a fine policy, that a flagpole can have just as much negative impact on a neighbor as any other kind of structure. And we talked in our letter about what some of those potential negative impacts are. Uh, the photograph that Ms. McGee referred to, I think shows absolutely clearly, and, and first of all, by the way, keep in mind that Mr. Nelson's property uh, is just on the other side of that row of, and I forgot which botanical species it is, but that row of shrubs. Uh, there are hundreds of places, literally, on this particular neighbor's property to put a flagpole. 
The property is, I think, 1.7 acres, has 150 to 200 feet of frontage on the water. Why does that flagpole have to be located when you count the crossbar just four or five feet from the neighbor's property? Why can't it be set back the same as any other structure is required to be set back under the ordinance? The existing ordinance protects property owners against structures being too close to the property line. And I guess our request for the council tonight and kind of our message to the council is the existing ordinance is fine and it should be left alone. Uh, this is not a great debate in the town in terms of lots of people being interested in it at this point. This is two property owners at this point. It's been handled by the code enforcement officer and the municipal attorney as a code enforcement issue, and it really should be left there. So we would urge uh, this committee tonight to essentially kill this bill in committee uh, so that these two neighbors can go about their business and code enforcement can take care of the flagpole uh, and require that it be set back according to the ordinance. Now, I don't know whether Mr. Nelson wants to add anything. He is, he is the property owner, and uh, I see him getting up. Thank you. And if you have any questions for me, obviously. Thank you, Attorney Baniotis. Uh, I'm uh, Bruce Nelson. I live at 890 Shore Road. I uh, came to Cape Elizabeth looking around the room, I'm probably the most elder longtime citizen here, coming here in 1972, and uh, except for maybe a year, somewhere about in the middle of these 36 years, I, I've lived here. I've lived at the house I'm at for the past 24 years. Uh, one of the nice things about living where I do is that uh, I'm blessed with a gorgeous view. It is just a panorama, which I thank uh, my lucky stars every day that I'm allowed to be there and to enjoy it. Um, it, is a, it is like right here, a, just an open panorama. And when I stand outside and I look to the boats in the ocean, it, it is fabulous. And I thank the few counselors who came by and saw uh, what I uh, uh, was concerned about. The flagpole base is as, about as far away as you and I are. So if I'm standing on my property, this 30-foot structure plus sidebar uh, with, I don't know how many flags can fly on it, uh, but it is bothersome because it takes about this much of this much of a view out if I'm standing on my property. And I uh, am as patriotic as Mr. Philitez, I am sure. I have a flag in my uh, living room that's about the same height as that flag over there with the eagles on top of it, and it's been sitting there for the past 22 years. Uh, so I am not unpatriotic. I uh, uh, love my view, and I don't think it's right that someone can put his flagpole or the structure that goes up over 30 feet uh, right next to my property. He has probably 200 feet of ocean frontage that it could be anywhere else. The side setback uh, was the uh, was what I called and asked about, and I was told that there is a side setback, and that's why I objected at the time. And um, I wish that you would uh, uh, not put the town through a uh, going through a whole process of, of changing the rules. The rules are, are, are acceptable to me, and I think they should be uh, continued. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. I'll now open up the floor for uh, council discussion on this. Um, Don't we need a motion? Well, uh, that would be my next uh, request. Would somebody like to make a motion? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Class? Okay. Well. The motion would be presumably to refer it to the planning board. If that's what you feel you'd like to move? It's not. Okay. 
Do we have a motion to refer this to the planning board? Seeing none. Uh, I'll make a motion to, so that we can discuss this, I'll make a motion to refer this to the planning board. We have a motion to refer the item to the, to the planning board. Do we have a second? I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Moved and seconded. A discussion. Uh, I just wanted to comment on something procedurally. It's been the town's tradition when folks have requested zoning ordinance amendments to not require them to go through the formal process that is in the ordinance of having to collect 10 signatures of, of different neighbors, and of, of not neighbors, of citizens. There, there are several different processes in, the, in the, the zoning ordinance. If you defeated this move to, to have it go to the, to the planning board, it is very easily overcome by the applicant uh, within the ordinance in a manner that uh, you'd be required to refer it to the planning board. I just said that in terms of just to let you know about the process and to let you know that by defeating it at this point, uh, the applicant could very easily come back and, and uh, you'd be listening to the same debate and arguments uh, uh, again. But it would ultimately come back to the town council? It would ultimately come back if, if, if the applicant decided at this point that they wanted to go through the, the formal process within the ordinance of requesting an amendment with uh, the, re the requisite provisions that, that that section of the ordinance has. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ann? Um, I, I think I, I've been out and looked at it, and I have no strong opinion either way. You know, I didn't go around, I didn't want to tromp all over Mr. Nelson's property, uh, so I just hung in his driveway, um, and I didn't want to tromp around on the other people's property. And ordinarily, it would seem to me that this is a dispute between two neighbors, and I'm not sure that we'd have to get involved in a big process. However, there are two other points. One is, is related to what Michael said. I, I am always sympathetic to if citizens petition their government through this process that we have to, to um, you know, they want to change an ordinance. Um, I think that we should respect that, and I also think it's going to come back anyways, even if, even if we killed it tonight. The other thing that concerns me about this, that I think it's a broader issue than just between two neighbors, is that it seems to me from our code enforcement officer's letter that while the ordinance may say one thing, the practice throughout town and in the town government is to entirely something different. Um, and in terms of, well, we don't need a permit, we do need a permit, and I'm not quite clear. And I don't know how many other town houses there are in town that may have flagpoles within 10 feet of a sideline or whatever, but I'm interested in making sure we know what we want as a town, and then we enforce it equitably. So I think I would vote to send it off to the planning board. Sir? That's what I was going to say. Sorry. Okay. Oh, I was going to say that it sends a different message to the planning board if it doesn't quite get through the council than if it does, it seems to me. So it seems mildly significant what we do tonight, despite the fact that the owner can then choose to get signatures and proceed. Thank you. Other discussion? David? Um, recognizing that the practice in the past may have been not to regulate the placement of flagpoles. I don't know whether it's ever been an issue. And you know, one neighbor may not have cared that their neighbor put up a flagpole that was a few feet from their property line, depending upon where it stood, uh, the size of the flagpole, um, just may not have made a difference. But to the extent that it does make a difference to a neighbor, um, that's why we have setbacks. And um, if Mr. Nelson doesn't want a 30-foot structure within the distance required by the ordinance or protected by the ordinance. I think it's his right to be able to rely upon the ordinances as we have them. Um, 
I think the ordinances are created for a reason, to protect property owners. Um, and I see no reason why we should voluntarily refer it to the planning board. If there's an obligation to refer it to the planning board, we will refer it to the planning board if the ordinances require that we do so with, with uh, the requisite number of signatures. But um, for a dispute between what appears to be a dispute between adjoining landowners, I see no reason for us to take any initiative to refer it to the planning board for a change. Thank you. Paul? I agree with David's comments, and I will be voting against it. I agree with David, and I'll be voting against it. Cynthia, did you have any comments? I have no comments. Uh, I'll be voting against the motion as well. Uh, I've read the documents that have been provided by uh, Attorney McGee, Attorney Van Yotis. I've heard the manager's explanation of the agenda item to uh, Attorney McGee. I've read the applicable ordinance and for invitation uh, in Attorney Van Yotis' uh, letter and from Mr. Nelson himself. I visited the site in question last Thursday afternoon. I personally don't even want to start down this road. Um, I think it has the potential to open a real can of worms. Uh, for example, what comes after flagpoles? You could have a, a monopole communication thing. You could, we haven't even talked about windmills yet, but uh, the windmills are really nothing more than a flagpole with a whirly gig on top. Um, I think from the photographs that were provided, we're led to infer that, that the pole would likely bear the American flag, and that may be true. That may be the intent of the current owner. Uh, but this isn't about patriotism. It's not about a lack of patriotism. Um, who's to say that the flagpole couldn't bear other flags or banners at some time that might be offensive to an abutting neighbor? Um, we don't know. Uh, to me, this is, this is about satisfying a complaint that's supported by ordinance, and it's about correcting a mistake. And it, it seems to me that the most reasonable way to correct this mistake is to move the pole and not to alter the law. Um, I will say that if the flagpole was placed in its present location due to incomplete or inaccurate information provided by the uh, code enforcement officer or, the, or town staff, then the town should be held liable for moving the pole. But I don't know if that's the case. So uh, I'll be voting in opposition to the motion as well. Any other discussion? Yeah, I I'm not arguing with the council decision. I just want to make sure that you understand the, the provisions within the ordinance. Uh, there is an amendment procedure in the, the zoning ordinance. Uh, and what it reads, it, and it goes into, you know, there could be a zone change fee that could be paid, and we don't usually ask for those. That could be required. But then, then the, the applicable provisions. The town council shall initially review our requests for zoning amendments. If the council determines that the request is legally faulty, that it conflicts with state law, or that it is clearly contradictory to established town policy, the council may deny the request without further action. Otherwise, the council shall initiate the formal review process. Prior to the consideration of any proposed amendment or change by the town council, it shall be submitted to the planning board for its recommendations. The planning board shall hold a public hearing on the proposed amendment, notice of the public hearing shall be published, et cetera. Uh, and then within the charter, the provision, excuse me just a second. Petition for enactment of an ordinance. Uh, subject to the provision of Section 1, not less than 10% of the registered voters of the town may at any time petition over their personal signatures for the enactment of any proposed lawful ordinance, and, and that goes on. So that, that provision is 10% is of the registered voters. So that would be, you know, approximately 750 signatures would be required. At one point there was, there was 10 required. That, I might have been thinking of something in the old zoning ordinance, but, but I read the, the provisions here specifically in the, uh, the zoning ordinance. Michael, could you, if, if I might, yeah. could you go back to the first thing you were yeah, reading and, and say on the process what the uh, three reasons were that, that 
if the council uh, not forward it If the council determines that the request is legally faulty, comma, that it conflicts with state law, comma, or that it is clearly contradictory to established town policy, comma, the council may deny the request without further action. Otherwise, the council shall initiate the formal review process. Then, Jim, um, then it doesn't seem to me that it's legally faulty. It doesn't seem to me it contradicts the state ordinance. Now, I'm, I'm no lawyer, but, um, and then contrary to town policy, if it had contrary to town ordinance, then maybe, I think it was more shaky, but the town policy to me seems a little shaky because, um, because of what the code enforcement officer said about the way that is the current practice, the practice of, um, I don't have it, I can't find it in here, but his letter <coughs> that even though maybe it, he, he said you didn't need a permit, then suddenly he said, well, you do need a permit. So it's not clear to me that it falls under one of those three categories. We did have an oral opinion from the town attorney, uh, Michael Hill, uh, that was mentioned in one of our documents, correct? We did have, an, yeah, Bruce Smith made his decision after receiving advice from Michael Hill. But, Cynthia? Well, I, I mean, I could certainly argue that the request is legally faulty just for all the reasons that Attorney Van Iotis set forth. However, I think this discussion just reinforces to me the need to have a public hearing and have the planning board review it. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of um, facts and law to be analyzed in a more um, comprehensive fashion by people who are familiar with the zoning ordinance. And so that's why I'm going to be voting to refer it to the planning board. I, that's not a predisposition on how I ultimately will decide this issue should it come back to us. But I agree with Anne that this is more of a process question for me. And I don't see any harm with having the planning board review it and applying their expertise. <coughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I suggest we vote. Further discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion to refer the item to the planning board? Two. Opposed? Motion defeated. Mr. Two Chairman, four. it would be my recommendation that the council make a finding of fact that it's either legally faulty or that it conflicts with state law or that it is clearly contradictory to established town policy. Okay. We have a recommendation from the manager. I apologize, but my kids are home alone, and I need to go. Can you guys proceed without me? Can you uh, wait until we finish this one item, since you've already voted on it once? Are we voting again? Um, we will have to vote on it. Um, I move that, um, that uh, as, as, part of the, uh, as, as part of our vote, we um, uh, make a formal finding that the requested ordinance change is clearly contrary to established town policy. Second. Moved and seconded that we find that the uh, change is, in, is, is contrary to uh, municipal policy. I think the specific wording, um, as the town manager read it, was clearly contrary to established, established, town, established town policy. Mm -hmm. But what, I, I don't mean to interfere, but what you might like to do is, uh, is uh, make sure that this is properly drafted so that it, it complies with. Uh, well, David's an attorney. We can well, him. is that up to uh, our town attorney to draft for us? I, I, think, I think to be on the safe side, it would be wise to have it drafted. And, uh, Properly, you know, if that's the desire of the council, and properly, uh, properly prepared so that it would be sustainable if that's the majority will of the council. Is that something that we would look to? I'd give uh, Tom Leahy a call, town attorney, to prepare tomorrow and ask that it be prepared for Wednesday evening, and that you might take that up as a special item uh, following the council workshop at a special meeting. Um, then is the uh, manager recommending that we uh, table our vote on this until Wednesday evening? Yeah, the, the manager is simply recommending that whatever the majority desire of the council is, that it be sustainable. And I think that would help. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Thank you. Just 
so glad she recused herself. David, would you like to withdraw your motion in favor of the, the manager's recommendation, or would you like to, to sustain it? Um, well, I think the manager's point is well taken, um, and that um, we should probably um, make our further finding um, with the support of our town attorney on Wednesday evening. Basically what I'm saying is I think you'd want to spell out how it's contradictory to establish town policy. You want to create a, a, a record of your vote. Can we sustain our vote this evening and go on to draft that? I would suggest, to answer the question what directly was asked a minute ago, I would suggest that you, you table this item with the understanding that uh, it would be revisited uh, at, the, at the call of the, the council, a special meeting on Wednesday night. Sarah. I can't be here on Wednesday night. And she's uh, I can be here very late. So well, you could table it, it to the May meeting. There's no reason why you, you, you have to do it tonight. We have a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Um, it could, what is the motion? I just want to make sure. To find contrary to town policy. Well, uh, my motion, um, I'll withdraw my motion. Motion withdrawn. Uh, I would accept the motion to table. So moved. I have a motion to table until? The May meeting. Mm. Till the May meeting? The May meeting. Motion to table, second. We moved and seconded that we table the further discussion until the May Town Council meeting. All in favor? Unanimous. Excuse if I me, might, that the problem is Peggy and Chris both, I go to these municipal law seminars and they both teach, teach us as municipal officials how to do those type things. So sometimes their own advice. Uh, Can I please? Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> <sighs> well, that was painful. Do we have more votes? It's I almost objected to uh, Marianne recusing herself. Serious. You should have. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. That was great. <laughs> Lively discussion. I'll give you the chair again <laughs> at the May meeting. Not right on. <laughs> the whole meeting. <laughs> hey, um, the next item on our agenda is item 68, and uh, it is recommended to reappoint Sherry Gower as warden, to appoint Ruth Noble as deputy warden for all 2008 elections, and to approve the nominations of the political parties and the election workers as was set out in a list in your packet. And I think Ruthie delivered some of this. Did everyone get an update? Which list? list? I've got two different lists. Okay. Um, I will read. I will read the names to you. I think I have the updated list. I don't need that because I'm recusing myself. We. Okay. Um, the updated list is Democrats: Bill Wadman, Norma Wadman, Pamela Anderson, Margaret Davenport, Carol Ann Jordan, Mark Russell, David Morton, and Lynn Unger, who was moved from the Republican side to the Democratic side. I guess that was a typo. <laughs> and then the Republicans would be Sherry Gower, Barbara Adams, Jane Harley, Audrey Jordan, K. Scott Berry, Marguerite Hollowell, Mary Rivoto, James Ricker, and Nancy Ricker. Would, is Sherry Gower still on? She's not on the list as a Republican. She's just up here as She's warden. She is not on the list as, oh, I was reading from the wrong a, list. Uh, revised list. I thought I was reading from the revised list. Yeah, that's why I was wondering. Oh. Okay, so Sherry Gower and um, Ruth Noble are the warden and deputy wardens. Yes. So we have eight Democrats yes. and eight Republicans, is that correct? Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> so is there a motion? So moved. And a second? second? Any discussion? Yeah, I don't know if you ever heard Ruth say, but we need more from both parties to particularly to run the presidential election. November. So if anyone's interested in being a, a election worker at the polls and does it in a, in a you know, it's you're an, you're an official, you and don't get involved in the process. Um, are they compensated? Yeah, con yeah. Maybe How much do we pay? Trained, yeah. compensated, um, eight dollars an hour. Eight dollars an hour. Maybe some of our senior citizens or other folks would be interested. Can independents do it, or must it yes, be independents mm -hmm. also? Great. 
So anyone who's interested in working on Election Day, particularly the presidential election. Uh, and other I, important elections. Do they have to be registered voters? Yes. Okay. Perhaps even, I know the high school is off that day, so maybe some high school 18-year-olds who are registered voters as well. Absolutely. All in favor? Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Please raise your hands. That would be one, two, three, four, five, six, zero, please. And there are no citizens left to discuss items not on our agenda. I did I want to mention one thing. If you notice, we had new cameras this evening. That was part of the franchise agreement with Time Warner Cable, and yeah. those were installed uh, with help from the technology department and the private firm that did it over the next couple of, okay. the last couple of days. I, I appreciate the council's patience tonight. I know it was a long meeting. Um, I know I heard from one councillor who thought it might be a very quick meeting. I've learned in my six years on the council that whenever you think it will be a quick meeting, it is not. <laughs> Um, but w you recall that one of our goals was to provide, I think, greater opportunities for public participation. And um, we had an opportunity to do that tonight. So I thank you all for your patience and forbearance. It's a late night. And we'll have a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? That would be 6 0. Oh. Yes. <laughs> thank you. I think Sarah would agree to